Um, let me give you a little bit more uh, uh, biographical data on this, just to give you a little bit of a, a, a little bit more color on the record. Uh, Smart Studios was a two-story building. Upstairs um, was the lounge, um, and that, of course, that's where we mostly hung out if we weren't working. And um, and I remember a couple things that that stand that stand to mind. One is the Iraq War broke out while we were recording, and so it was literally the classic scenario of like you're standing in front of the TV watching CNN watching the world on fire, and then you march back downstairs and start recording. It was during that period that we met the Frogs, who we stopped playing locally, obviously became a big influence on, on us and close personal friends, and God rest in his soul. Um, he passed away about seven or eight years ago now. Uh, if you don't know the Frogs, please go out of your way to check out the Frogs, uh, our dear friends. And um, there was one other detail. Oh, I remember. There was something where we had to go in the middle of making the record, and this is a good way to end, in the middle of the making the record, we had to go to New York for a trip. I don't remember what it was. It might have been to play CMJ or something. There was some sort of reason why we had to pack up our gear, get in the van, drive to New York, and, and be there. And so there was, a, there was an ask or a demand, depending on who you ask, from the record label to hear our work in progress because there was great concern we were going to go over budget. And so I remember sitting in the office of the CEO of the record label, playing him instrumental versions of some of the songs that I've talked about. No vocals, just, just the backing tracks. Guitars, no overdubs, just bass, drums, and guitar. And, in, and that meeting changed everything because once he heard what we were doing, even though it was a work in progress, he was blown away. He was like, this is way, way better than I thought it was going to be. Keep going. You're doing great. And then one other little coda. The man who eventually became our, uh, our, our, uh, our radio rep, at a, at a label down the road, that's a story for another day, happened to be in town. And uh, now that I understand these better, I thought he was stopping by to be friendly and meet the band. Um, classic radio guy, you know, so, so something right out of Spinal Tap. And, uh, and, and so we got this thing, hey, you know, so-and-so from the record label, the big label, not, not the independent, the big label's in town. Can he stop by and hear the record? And we looked like, oh, fuck, we don't want to play this guy the record. So we came full on, you know, Loud, loud, literally right out of Spinal Tap, had the loud coat and everything, fast talking. And we sat down, we played him three or four songs. I don't remember what state of progress we were in. I think we were more towards the end of the process, so at least there were some vocals and stuff like that. And what I didn't realize is he was a spy sent there to report back on our progress because whoever was paying the bill up, up on top really wanted to know whether we not we had a future. And thankfully, he left and went back and reported that that the record we had was going to was was going to was going to be successful and so that sort of greased the wheels and put in motion things that we didn't we couldn't possibly understand at the time so thankfully we were able to give them a record that they got behind as i've said a few times at the time it became uh the biggest selling independent album of all time i think it sold about four hundred fifty thousand copies in the first couple of years uh which is why though although we're continually written out of the history when we did the tour with the Chili Peppers, it was the Chili Peppers, Smashing Pumpkins, and a little band called Pearl Jam, um, who had just put out their their debut record. We were riding high on the success. Of course, people keep trying to write us out of that history, too. That's fine. That's a story for another day. But the fact of the matter is, it's a hugely successful record. Um, the other day, I know it was a couple weeks ago, you know, typical, you know, you're flipping through, you know, Instagram. Somebody tags me on, on Gish, and uh, okay, you know, Everybody's got an opinion. I'm looking what the guy says. And he says, this record's largely forgotten. Um, no, this record's not largely forgotten. Um, it's a platinum record. Um, there aren't a lot of records in this world that go platinum. I'd say that's not forgotten. Secondarily, it's a hugely influential record. Had a lot to do with everything that followed, including the production of Nirvana's Nevermind, because Butch took some of the recording processes that I had brought into the studio and applied them to Nevermind. He's talked about in the interviews. That's not a conspiracy theory. Um, the way people recorded guitars, the way people approached their records, uh, very much changed after Gish. And let me give one last credit where credit is due. The Gish production style, which by and large is very dry and very in your face, was a deliberate decision on my part. Um, and again, Butch did an incredible job getting the tones, but it was me who wanted the record dry. It was me who wanted, because at the time, people were kind of into what they call a Steve Albini production, kind of room mics up, real real kind of boomy if you heard like Pixies or Nirvana's album, you know, that sort of bigger, uh, all apologies, that sort of bigger room sound. I wanted to go the other way. And who was my influence on that? Rick Rubin. 
I was listening to some of the record. I didn't know Rick Rubin at the time. I was listening to some of the records that Rick was doing. Who was Rick emulating? Black Sabbath, who was my favorite band, Black Sabbath. So when I heard Rick's production, I thought, oh, he's doing Black Sabbath. And so Gish had everything to do with us doing Rick's version of Black Sabbath. Guitars cranked in your face. Keep it simple. Get the Aussie vocal in the middle. And so I think uh, there's, of course, many more details, I'm sure, that are in there if you just hit me in the head enough. But I hope you've enjoyed this deep dive. Um, the stories get better, I promise you. Uh, they're not as deep here as they could be, but because, you know, you're, you're basically talking about a band capturing a snapshot in time. We were a, a typical club indie band that was lucky enough to land a record deal after being rejected by every label multiple times. We go in the studio. Incredibly, we don't write any new, new songs except a couple kind of psychedelic jams. We go in and wing it. Thankfully, we're, we're with a future legend in Butch Vig who gets us to play our best and be our best, particularly Butch as a drummer challenging Jimmy. Um, did I skip over Snail? I did. I know somebody's going to write me that. If you don't mind, I'll go back to Snail. All apologies. No pun intended. Because Snail is something I want to talk about, and it brings me back to Jimmy. That's a perfect way to end but I'll be quick about it. Snail is one take on the drums. I remember the day very clearly, standing there in the room, you know, like I said, earplugs in, headphones, a deafening, deafening drum sound. And Jimmy goes out and plays that take in one, in, in just one take. Um, and, and for drummers out there, you know what I'm talking about, sort of two thirds away the song, the song shifts from four, four to six, eight, which is very difficult to do. And then Jimmy plays those blistering fills um, coming off the solo. Um, that's, that's a real early indication of the drummer that Jimmy Chamberlain was going to become. I was certainly used to that guy. I'd played live with that guy. But when you saw it in the hot house of a studio, because not everybody when that red light goes on can play at that level. And uh, that's what makes Jimmy a star, uh, his ability on that. Um, I feel weird going out of sequence, going backwards, and I'm, my, my brain's all joggled. Again, unprofessional. Should have done a better job next time. Um, what else can I say about Snail? It's actually, uh, I sh you, you should kick me because it's one of my favorite pumpkin songs of all time. I think what's beautiful about Snail is it really captures the innocence of the band. Um, we were really prepared for the world we were about to enter into. And so what I love about that song is it has the optimism and the feel of who, in many ways, what I would try to say to you is, is that's who the band really is. The band without the pressure, the band without the aspiration, the band just being the band, kind of a little bit groovy, wearing our our thrift store psychedelic shirts. Snail is probably the best emulation on Gish of who the band actually is as the four personalities together. You know, the, the, the people we were at the time, not the people that we became, including myself, but the people we were at the time. So I have a soft spot in my heart for Snail, which is why I love st to still hear the song and still play it because unlike a lot of the other songs that have sort of aged in, at different degrees, depending on the influences and who I was trying to emulate and what I was trying to say, Snail is very much a true uh, spirit uh, thing and it, and, it, and it holds up not because it's a fantastic song but it's such a, a true song